you know, as we, we come tonight, it was really a privilege. Yesterday we had, we were working with Jonathan Conrath. He's invited myself um, to be part of the training team that he's doing for the Mission 24 School of Ministry that he's doing, and that's up in um, Swansea. And there was 40-some, 40 uh, 42, I think it was, um, uh, people various ages, different kinds of backgrounds, different nationalities who were there to study um, uh, for, for evangelism, to, to, to take on board, to be trained in it, so that they can go out and do the kind of stuff that many of, many of you have already been involved with. And it was just a privilege to be there. And, you know, one of the things that, um, one of the people who responded, we had a text through yesterday, maybe it was this morning, I'm trying to remember now, and, and they said that um, through, through the day that the gospel was preached from different angles, and teaching about what the substance of the gospel is. Because there's a difference between being one who's heard the gospel and even responded to the gospel, and one who's trained in it to be able to, to, to proclaim it. It's like watching someone build a house, and you go, yeah, I think I could do that. I watched a YouTube video. <laughs> and, and then giving it a shot yourself. It doesn't quite work as simple, does it? But there's something about being a wise master builder, Paul said about studying to show yourself approved of God. So you know how to handle the word. You know how to handle a, a, a proverbial spiritual sword. Uh, not cutting people, but bringing deliverance and freedom to them. And she said, I, I heard the gospel. This one lady said, I heard the gospel three times. And she goes, and every single time I wanted to re-give my life to Jesus. And she left there wrecked. I think for the last hour, all could, she could do is weep. And when God starts digging deep into your heart, when he really gets a hold of you, everything changes. Yeah. Amen? Amen? You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the, the Bible says that the gospel uh, to us who are being saved is the power of God. For us, it, for us who are already, who say we know Jesus... Uh, in verse 18 of chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, it says, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are what? Okay, so if the, if the gospel message to you is, eh, you're perishing. Simple as it gets. But to us who are being saved, it's what? Okay, now, it's not saying about those that are unsaved, it says those that are being saved. See, salvation, I know some of you already know this, but salvation is a big picture. When the, the, the word sozo, uh, it's, it's this word for salvation. It, it's, um, Ephesians chapter 2 says, I have been saved. We, we have been saved by grace through faith. The Bible says in, in Matthew, it says that those who endure to the end shall be saved. And, and then it, it says that to us who are being saved. So it's like a, I don't know if you ever had a multivitamin that's got everything that you need in it and you take the whole thing. That's salvation. It's the beginning. It's the middle. And it's the perseverance all the way to the end. It's his keeping power in your life. So let me just say to you, if you're someone who names the name of Jesus, you want to hear the gospel over and over and over, and over, and over again. It'll keep your heart soft. You remember where you came from? <laughs> where your hope is set? And grace is right in the middle. Because I need it. Amen? Amen. You guys are real quiet tonight. <laughs> I, I, I want you to turn to Romans. We, 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 we had the privilege of beginning to look at it last um, yesterday, but this morning we, we, we just touched on it. And if you haven't heard the message from this morning, I'd encourage you because I'm kind of build on that a little bit more this evening for just a few minutes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read from uh, this morning. We just read verse 1 and verse 16 and 17. But tonight I'm going to read from verse 1 and we're going to read down to, um, let's say we're down, down to verse 7 and then we'll jump over to 16 and 17. And just to kind of build on some of that that we saw this morning, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, 
called to be what? An apostle separated to the gospel of God, which he has promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be what? Saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Just jump down to verse 16 and 17. And this is Paul. He's saying this. He's in, he's in, this is who I am. And now, verse 16, I'm, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just or the righteous shall live by faith. faith. It's always that way. The Lord had his own blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word to us tonight. This morning, we, we just, we, we looked at Paul, just briefly, we, we looked at Paul, because remember, he was called Saul of Tarsus. He was opposed to Jesus. He hated anything to do with Jesus. He was going city to city looking for those who named the name of Jesus so he could take them to prison. He would trick them up as he was talking to them to get them to blaspheme. Because remember, they were all Jewish at this point for the beginning part of it. And he's going after them. And if they blasphemed, he'd have them executed. He'd have them stoned to death for blasphemy. And he intentionally did this. He was born a Jew. He was raised as a Pharisee. He was very religious. In fact, he was so religious, he said that if you looked at my life at the law standard of Moses, he said I was blameless. But the reputation for his violence and the the anger, the hatred towards Jesus went before him. And there were people who knew about it. Even when when, when Ananias, one of the guys who was, God says, go and pray for Paul because I've met with him. He's my chosen vessel. He's like, God, isn't that the guy that like, he was like going after Christians and he was destroying them. And, and, and God says, go, he's my chosen vessel. But his reputation had gone before him about the wickedness and the violence. It says he breathed out murder and violence towards the church and made havoc of it. This guy was opposed. He wasn't looking for Jesus. He wasn't looking for Jesus at all. In fact, he he did everything he could to fight him. No, you have to understand, this is the guy who's writing. The radical shift in his life of going from a hater of Jesus to a preacher and a lover of Christ. (laughs) That's amazing. But see, that's repeated again and again and again. Because every individual, listen to me, if you're a believer tonight, you started as a hater of Jesus. You say, well, I didn't think that way. It doesn't change where your heart was at. The Bible says that outside of Christ, we're enemies of God. And while we were still enemies, Christ died for us. While we were still opposed to him. I just, see, sometimes we're like, well, I don't hate you. It's just I'm going to do what I want to do to such a degree I'll run you over in the process. (laughs) And that was our lives as well as his see there's a time when you're not christian and there's a line you cross where you're taken out of darkness and you become please hear me no one is born a christian you must be born again please hear me i know we love our children but they're not christians because you are Uh, that's gonna step on some toes here i think they're not Christian because you are. We want it for them. We do. We pray it for them. We do. But they're not Christian because you are. And God doesn't have grandchildren. He has sons and daughters. They must be born again into the kingdom of God. And please hear me. If you're young tonight and you're here and you're still listening and not on your phone, that just because mom and dad go to church and they have to drag you there, or maybe you like going, which is great, 
But just because mom and dad say that they belong to Jesus doesn't mean that you do automatically. You need to put your trust in him yourself. You, you need to come to him. You need to say to Jesus, Jesus, I, I need you for me. I know mom and dad might be Christian, but Jesus, I need you for me. And you need to be careful how you address your kids in that way. <laughs> you go to church, and so maybe your, your behavior has changed a little bit, and then your children do things that are wrong, and you say, why do you do that? We're Christian. What? But they're not. But you're expecting them to act like one. Oh. Maybe just get them to be one rather than to act like one. Oh, Lord, help us. When I did security work at Tesco's, I did it for about 10 years. And because I know what the Bible teaches about the human nature and that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. They, 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 people do stuff that are wrong, and sometimes they're going, I don't even know why I do it. They get caught up in it, they run off and do stupid things, and when you get done with it, you're looking like, why did I do that, right? And so the managers, when we'd catch people who were, who were shoplifting, and sometimes they got violent and all that kind of stuff, praise God, I never got hit, hallelujah. But when I remember we'd bring them back, and the managers would all be like, why did you do that? I never asked the question. I mean, you know, certain times there's people who are in need, fair enough. And there's been time when we did it that the Holy Spirit turned on and said, you buy what they stole and give it to them. Yes, sir. The manager says, you can't spend your money on that. I said, you can't tell me how to spend my money. But the managers would say, why don't, why don't, why don't you think we should ask them why they do it? I said, because they don't know. It just pops in their head and they do it. The prince of this world. Everybody under the sway of the evil one. And without the Holy Spirit internally, when the idea comes, they just do it. Without even thinking about it sometimes, it rises inside. And that need for being born again, the need for that salvation is absolute. And Paul, he, he, he behaved this way and he was reacting against Christ and he saw the gospel as foolishness because he was perishing. But then when Christ met him on that road, he was, I'm sure you've heard the, the term, a Damascus Road experience. Paul, Paul, Paul coined it. <laughs> it was his life. And he's on the road to Damascus and he's intending to go there to go after some, some people who belong to Jesus. And he was going to get papers and, and authority from the chief priest back in Jerusalem to get these and to bring them back. And, to, and as he's going there, Jesus, in, in midday, all of a sudden a light shines on him that's brighter than the sun at noon in Syria. That's bright. I know we don't really are aware of what the sun looks like much in Wales, but trust me, it's bright. <laughs> and it shone, God knocked him to, to the ground. And... He goes blind for three days. And he says, who are you, Lord? He says, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. Wow, total rethink. Total shift. And see, for Paul, God is light, and in him there's no darkness. So that revelation of Jesus being the light of the world, shining down, blinding him, there was no argument. And, and then he goes from that state and, and he writes to this Roman church. He's never been there before. He's never been to Rome. He wants to go to Rome. He keeps trying to get to Rome. But for whatever reason, he's hindered here and there. He even states it. I want you to know in verse 13 of Romans. He says, I want you to know. Um, I want you to be. Uh, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now. And his desire was to go to Rome and to preach. And, and so he can't get there. So while he's in Corinth, he writes a letter to them and kind of lays out the Christian faith. He describes himself as Paul. It, he was Saul of Tarsus. The name changes. He says, I'm a bondservant. We went over a lot of this this morning, but the bondservant was somebody in Israel who sold themselves into slavery instead of living on the streets. God made a provision that instead of living rough and dying of, starv out, of starvation, you could actually give yourself to a fellow Israelite and they had the responsibility to take care of you. 
and you stay there for a certain period of time, and then a year jubilee, it was cut off in that sense, you were released, you were free. But some guys would be like, dude, my master is just so awesome, I want to stay. <laughs> like, I got a house, I got a wife, I got kids. I, listen, I, I built my life, and like, I'm just, I'm willing to continue to serve and being provided for. And so they would take, their, take them to a post, and they would be, they, they, they would pierce their ear. I don't know if they left like the earring in there, it's probable. But they became a bond servant. They did it willingly. I don't want to leave. <laughs> I'm yours. I just want to live here with you, master. And Paul says, that, that's me with Jesus. I don't just serve because I have to. I love my master and I don't want to go anywhere else but with him. Murderer? Blasphemer? Opposed to Jesus? Now? He's my life says for me to live is christ to, to die is gain it's no longer i who live but christ who lives in me that's a change isn't it he says i'm a bond servant he says i'm i'm, I'm called to be an apostle separated to the gospel of god now he, he goes on and he begins to de de to describe the gospel here see if you can pick out the points of the gospel in this it says, which he promised God, it's the gospel of God, which he, God, promised through, before through his prophets in where? Now, remember, he's writing this. So this isn't in the Bible yet. So Romans isn't kind of part of the canon of Scripture, they call it. It's the 27 uh, books in the New Testament. So there were some that were written by the time Paul writes this in, in, the, in, in the 60s or so. And, and by the time he writes it, there was a few of the Gospels written. There was some other stuff that was written, but it hadn't been collated and brought together in a book like we have it. So he's still writing it. He actually ends up writing like 13 out of the 27 books. In the book of Hebrews, people debate whether Paul wrote it or somebody else wrote it. Fair enough. So it could be 14. But, but he writes, he's almost half of the New Testament. He writes, my goodness, that guy's been changed. And God advocates it by his spirit. So when he's speaking of it, he's not talking about what he, what's written in the New Testament. He's talking about the Old Testament prophecies. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 16, at the very, or pardon me, in Romans 16, at the very end, he calls it the prophetic scriptures. In verse 26 of chapter 16, he says, Now, but now made manifest this mystery that God is going to bring salvation. Now this, this has been made manifest by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations. And so he's talking about this, this announcement that God had that he was going to send Messiah, that he was going to come by a virgin birth, that it would be God incarnate, that he would come and he would bring salvation, he would bring forgiveness, he would bring healing, he would, by the resurrection of the dead, he would give eternal life. All of that was spoken long, long before Paul even wrote any of this. That this Jesus came. Now, I, uh, as I was studying, as I was looking at the text, uh, it says, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Uh, let me just show you one. We, we sing them at, 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 at Christmas, don't we? Isaiah 9, was Isaiah 6, I just have to double check. Some of you are mumbling there, I can't hear you. So if I, if I, if Isaiah 6, I think it is, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Isaiah 6, 11. No, that's not it. 9, 9, 6. Thank you. I, sometimes, some, I don't know. Someone said I had dyslexia. I don't believe him. So. I see it's Isaiah 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. You see the propheticness of this. I know it's 50-50. It's either a boy or a girl. But... And the government will be upon his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. What's that next phrase? So this guy who's born into the world is God? This isn't, this is, that's amazing. He's called Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the, see the essence of, of the, the, the deity, the fullness of the Godhead dwell bodily in Jesus. Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. 
In other words, what he said about I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it is absolutely true. In order to establish it with judgment and justice from that time forever, that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts, that's the warrior God who will perform this. These are spoken of Isaiah 53. It's the one forbidden chapter Jews aren't supposed to read. Because it just, if you read it, you'd be like, that's Jesus. Historically, it's just almost obvious. And they're not supposed to read it because the testimony would come to them. Because the gospel was for the Jew first. And then for the nations. That's what happened in the early church. It was all Jewish. Paul was Jewish. In fact, Jesus was Jewish. But something interesting here, because when you begin to look at this, verse 3, it says, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So he says, listen, that, that this prof- prophetic scriptures, these, these testimonies that were given through prophets that were written down for us, It was about this Jesus of Nazareth, this Jesus Christ, Jesus Messiah, who is our Lord. He says, but he's the son of God. Now, the reason I want to draw your attention to that is, listen, when Jesus came into the world, he didn't at some time become the son of God. So so it's not like when I've heard people say, so when he was anointed, when he began to minister and the Holy Spirit came upon him, that that's when he became the son of God. That's a lie. Do you realize that that is at his conception? The name Jesus wasn't even given by Mary and Joseph. It was given from heaven. The angel said, you'll give him the name Jesus. And Gabriel's only giving the the commandment that came from the throne room. (laughs) You're going to give him the name Jesus. And this holy thing which will be conceived in you will be called the Son of God. So from his conception, he he was the Son of God. In fact, go back further. In eternity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's always been the Son of God. And he came from everlasting and was born in Bethlehem. He is God with skin on his face. The fullness of the Godhead dwelt bodily. But if you looked at him, you wouldn't have seen it. If you looked at him, he would have looked like a little Jewish guy with black hair. He's not a white dude with blonde hair. He's not European. He's Jewish, Middle Eastern. In fact, when they looked at him, where did this power come from that you've got? See, if he looked like what you know we, we do in the cartoons, like, hey, it looks like this, we'd be like, yeah, of course you have power. But no, wh- where did the power come from? How did you do that? How did you raise that guy from the dead? How did you cast that demon out? Uh, where, where does that power, where does the authority come from? They recognized it was spiritual, but some of them were like, well, I can't believe that's God. So they actually gave credit to the evil one. It's bizarre. He's fulfilling the scriptures. He's fulfilling what God had said in the, in that he would come heal the sick, the blind. He would preach the gospel to the poor. And he's doing all this. And they say, well, it's not God. I mean, come on. But if you looked at him, you wouldn't have seen. In fact, the Bible says there was no beauty in him that you would have been drawn to him. We're so much image-based, aren't we? In, in our culture now, it is. It's all image, isn't it? We have filters. They can make you look older. They can make you look younger. They can make you look pretty. Some of us may not need it. Other of us, well. But, but we do it. It's all image. You know, we, we, we put on the clothes. We put on the... Uh, on, you know, we get our mojo on. And, but because we want to impress everyone by the way we what? Look, we, we're, we're concerned about the impression that we leave with people. If you looked at Jesus, there would have been no beauty or the Bible uses the word comeliness that you would have been drawn to him. You would have walked by him in the street and probably not even turned your head to notice but he's the son of God. Do you think maybe we often look for the wrong thing? 
Do you often think that we, we value things that are actually not really valuable because we get impressed by the image of things? Hmm. He's the son of God. He was born of the seed of David. And, and in other words, in this, according to the flesh, so, so God promised that through Israel, the nation of Israel, remember, you, you go back to Abraham, you can go back further, but we, Abraham, he's the father of the faithful. You know, God it gave him righteousness because he believed God. And he had, he had Isaac, and then Isaac had uh, uh, Jacob and Esau, and then Jacob had a wrestling match with God, got his name changed to what? Israel. Then he had a bunch of kids, and, and, and they became the 12 tribes of Israel. And then they multiplied, and then they became the nation of Israel. And then he took them out of Egypt and led them to the area of Canaan, and he gave them the land, and it became the land of Israel. Israel. He said, through you, in fact, through one of the tribes, which is Judah, I, I'm going to bring the Messiah. And that's why in two of the Gospels you have this genealogy, that takes you all the way back. Some goes back to Adam. One of them goes, Luke goes back to Adam. Matthew goes back to Abraham and says, look, and it always goes through David because David's obedience to God, God says, I'm going to have someone who's going to sit on the throne forever. It's amazing. When you're obedient to God, do you realize that generations after you can be blessed because of your obedience? It can also go the other way. But by your obedience, that God can bless generations to come because you've decided it's Jesus, you're my everything. And it still happens today. And it comes through David. And God makes a promise that he's going to reign on David's throne. Now, the only thing I just want to mention is that David's throne is where? Nobody knows? Yeah. Jerusalem. Jerusalem. It's not in heaven, is it? That's, that's God's throne. David's throne is in Jerusalem. Do you realize that the promise when Jesus returns that he's going to take up David's throne in Jerusalem? You mean he's like coming back and going to be here? Yeah. When Jesus returns, often we think, well, everyone's just going to go to heaven. That's, no, that's not what's going to happen. In fact, he's going to deal with the enemies of God with the breath of his mouth. Yeah. Oh, it's going to get quite intense. It says the nations will mourn and say, hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. Oh, it's amazing. But he reigns, and he's going to reign on David's throne. And so what happens is that when Jesus the Messiah comes, he comes through the line of David according to the flesh. But remember, where does he come from originally? Is this too deep for y'all? I'm, I'm trying to work it through because this is important because how can you believe in him whom you've not heard? So if you don't know who he is, because we're going to get onto a couple of other things that might shake you a bit. And, and I need you to understand who we're dealing with. Because he came down from heaven. Jesus says it over and again, over again. I've come down from heaven, not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. And he comes, but through his obedience, there's, there's nothing in him as far as in the flesh that you would say that he's special, that he's, and, but the power of God, the anointing of God, the Messiahship, he's fulfilling every prophetic word. And then he goes to the cross and he's raised from the dead. He goes to the cross, he dies. You don't bury dead people, he was buried, right? His mama was there. If there was wiggle of a finger, mama wouldn't have let him put him in the tomb. She would have run off with him as best as she could have. But he was placed in the tomb, he was wrapped up. I don't go along with the shroud of Turin. Okay, I think maybe I'll touch that for a second. If you lay something across someone's face like this, and there's an imprint, ladies, if you did it with a towel, and you did your makeup, and you put it on your towel, and you put it on, and you take it off, what's on the towel looks nothing like your face. Why? Because it's stretched out like this. And they say the Shroud of Turin wrapped around Jesus and left the imprint that was what? Looking like him? The Bible says he was wrapped up. 
with 150 pounds or so worth of uh, aloe and myrrh. He was dead. But the Bible says here, Paul says, he says, listen, Jesus, verse 4, and declared to be the Son of God with what? Power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. I'll break it down. The spirit of holiness, as I've said, that's just the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. (laughs) It's not complicated. The Holy Spirit, that he was raised to life by the Spirit of God. He he was raised up, his body transformed. He no longer looked marred except for the scars that were on him. He was, his body was whole and and he's glorious. He's raised up and, and not just kind of limping out. He's like, oh, I'm glad I made that out of there. He's raised up with power. They said they had to open this tomb to make sure because he was already out. You see, he didn't need anyone to roll back the stone for him. They had to look in. He had raised from the dead with power, but he's declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection. How do you know Jesus really is the Son of God? Because he rose from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead. There was a, Josh McDowell was a guy who did his doctorate trying to prove that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. So he was doing a PhD, trying to prove the resurrection was false. You know what happened? After all the evidence was placed before him and he searched it all out, he's like, no, he rose from the dead. He becomes Christian and now he goes all over the world preaching it. You can get books. He puts it all, all his study stuff in, in, in books so you can read it for yourself. This has happened over and over and over again. People have tried. Jesus has risen from the dead, but... It says that he's declared to be the son of God with power, but Paul already says he's the son of God. Is he just repeating himself? No. Now, I hope we can grasp this. Jesus in his person is the son of God, but because of his obedience, he was given a greater crown. Because he condescended and came down and he was obedient and willing to give his life as a ransom for us and to go to die and and even to die the death of the cross. Because of that, God, God raises him from the dead and then declares in power, it's like a new title, but it's like a greater title. He is the son of God but he declares that he's the son of God. Now, now this is important because this is for us This has already happened, right? So Jesus has already risen from the dead. When they were looking forward to it, even while they were, you know, John's there hanging out with Jesus, he is the son of God. But after the resurrection, after the resurrection happens, God declares Jesus the son of God with power. And now now he gives him the highest place in all of eternity. So what happens is this, because Jesus is the son of God and he reigns with power, well, he's your, he's your intercessor. <laughs> he's your great high priest. He's the one that sits on the throne and he sees you. When you go to him for help, because he was the son of God who suffered and now he's the son of God who reigns, he can give you help every single point. <clears throat> so when you call on his name, and you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, it's not just talking about when he was on the earth, he's the Son of God. He was the Son of God. But that (coughs) because he's risen from the dead, and he has this title, this crown, this title, he is the Son of God with power. Hebrews begins to pick that up. I just want to touch on a couple here. (laughs) Hebrews chapter one. And and you'll see why I'm going down this road. This is important. So Hebrews one and and verse verse, verse two, it, it says that God spoke in time past by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us in his son. Is that right? On last days, yeah, and his son. So it's not just what Jesus did was on the planet. He's revealed the way of salvation in in him because he's the son of God. 
And he keeps using this phrase. He, he says it in, in uh, um, he says that uh, he's the firstborn among many brethren. In, in chapter five, it says, which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son today have begotten you. And again, I will make him a father and he shall be to me a son. You know, I heard somebody say this once some time ago. He said, you know, the Muslims say, well, where in the Bible does Jesus ever say, I'm God, worship me? How about this verse? It says, God says to the Son, let all the angels of God worship him. And so God just doesn't tell man to worship. He tells the beings that are more powerful than you and I. And he says, you bow and you worship the Son. He's the Son of God with power. Salvation is found in no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. A dead Savior can't help you. But the risen Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, has power to save completely those who come to God through Him. Amen? Amen. See, if you trust in Him, He's already got it. Death, He kicked butt. It's done. The devil, he crushed him under his feet. The final one will be when death is won and cast into the lake of fire itself. He's the son of God with power. The absolute total authority. And God says, I'm going to make every enemy of yours and I'm going to place them under your feet. Oh, Lord, help us. Worshipped by angels. It says that in verse 8 here of, of Hebrews in chapter 1, it says, But to the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is, is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. He's, he's giving him a throne that's above every throne. He's bringing all of his enemies and Jesus' enemies will be made subject to him. Every one of them. Can I say to you, you're either his enemy or you're his friend. Jesus said, if you don't gather to me, you scatter. If you're not for me, you're against me. He said those words. They didn't believe him then. Those that lived at that time, they believe him now. But it's too late. We doing all right? Yeah. Chapter 3 of, of Hebrews, it says that Moses was a servant in the house of God. But Jesus is the son over the house. And if we belong to him, that's who we are. We're his house. It's not the four walls. We are his house. Let me just ask you a question then. Remember Psalm 2? It's a prophetic announcement about the Son of God who's coming and our response that ought to be to him. Sorry, take a second here. Doug's probably already got it up there. I don't know. Psalm 2. In fact, the part that I want to go to, verse 12, actually. God says, today I've begotten you. You're my son. But notice verse 12. It, it says what? Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are those who put their trust in him. Oh, let me. If you had a friend of yours who was not well, maybe their, their child was really unwell. They need a new kidney. <laughs> and you decided that, well, I'll, I'll help them out. I'll give them one. I got two of them, I'll give them one. And after you go through all the procedures and everything and you, you give them that life-saving piece and then 
Uh, let me change it. Let, uh, let's say it's your child who's done it because you couldn't match. And so your child, they're willing to do it and everything's agreed that they're maybe at school or whatever. And, 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 and after the procedure is done, the person who was given to just turns around and starts talking bad about you. How would you feel? I'll be honest. Oh, I'll be, oh it'd be all right. No, you wouldn't. Be, the hairs on the back of your neck would stand up. Yeah? You may have to go through the process of forgiveness, fair enough, but boy, you'd like, I'm, Lord, I need help with this one because I'm struggling. I just gave. My child gave a part of their body for that person to be able to live. And now they're treating it as though it's nothing. Hebrews again, Hebrews 6. I'm going to start reading from verse 3. Actually, verse 4. Sorry, Doug. Listen very closely, please. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessing from God, but it bears thorns and briars. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed whose end is to be burned. I want to read one more passage before I comment. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 20. Remember, this is the writer of the Hebrews. Now this is Peter who's writing this. Second Peter 2. For if after they escape the pollutions, the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and turned from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it happens to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. These are New Testament. This isn't Old Testament. This is New Testament. My point is this. You don't play with the Son of God. <laughs> this is serious, guys. I, I've, I've been around. I've, I've counseled. I've had people come and they say, yeah, I trusted in Jesus and then they've lived horrendously and some at the baptism of the Spirit, speaking in tongues and used of God, and then have gone back. And then they find no room for repentance. It's like they keep trying, but it just doesn't, no traction in it. I want to caution, we don't play with the Son of God. God gave his Son, not a kidney, but his entire person on the cross. He gave everything for you and for me. And once we've come to know that, tasted of it, now this isn't talking about a new believer who's struggling to try to get their feet. This is talking about someone, they've heard it, they've tasted it, they've touched it, they've, they've been in it, and somehow in the midst of it, they're like, eh. Peter says it would be better for them if they'd never known anything of Jesus 
than to have turned from the commandment that they had received and had been changed and now have gone back. The writer to the Hebrews says, even if they try to come back, <laughs> it's not happening. I find that frightening. I, I know people say, well, I thought you believed this. I thought you believed this. I believe the word of God. If the word says it, then it's true. No matter what your theological line is, if the word of God says it, it's true, he's not someone you play with. He's the son of God with power. Galatians 5, real quick. Um... Beginning with verse 16, Doug. I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the, what? It says, you will not, by the way, you shall not. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you're led by the spirit, you're not under law. Now the works of the flesh are what? Evident, they're obvious which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. Lewdness is unrestrained lust. You just give yourself to everything. Idolatry, sorcery, the word pharmakeion, that has to do with drugs. Hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, dissension, heresies. Heresies, the, the, the core word for the word heresies is the word choice. I'll choose what I believe. That's a heresy rather than coming in line with what the truth is in the word of God. I'll choose what I want to believe. Heresies. Envies, murders, drunkenness, revelries. Those are like, when you, you know when people get drunk and they're marching down the street having a good old time? That's a revelry. Drinking parties. And the like. Listen to what Paul says. Of which I tell you, of, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things, what? Say, well, I'm Christian. I prayed the prayer. I got baptized, but I'm still living like this. Ephesians. Verse 2, chapter 5, verse 2. And walk in love. As Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for its sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication, that's sex outside of marriage. Listen, that doesn't just mean, if I, sorry, I know we got kids here, that just doesn't mean everything, the whole package. The touchy-feely bits. You're messing around in ways. You're kissing somebody else's wife if you're not married to her. Stop messing around with it. Hmm. Fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness. Let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting which is not fitting, but rather giving thanks. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, or covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance of the kingdom of God or of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. I'm just showing you, it's again and again said, so it's not something that's isolated so, the first verse, Corinthians 6, and, and then we'll just kind of bring it into a conclusion here for tonight. Verse 9 of chapter 6, verse Corinthians, do you not know that the unrighteous, what? Okay, they will not inherit the kingdom. Okay, so you need to know they won't. Don't be deceived by it. It doesn't matter what people claim. 
It's, it's the reality of the fruit, isn't it? You know a tree by its? I know that's normal, right? You go outside in the garden, you know what kind of tree it is by what kind of fruit shows up. The tree's growing in your garden, I don't know what kind of fruit, I don't know what kind of tree it is. Wait for a fruitful season. It'll tell you. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Paul's saying that because people can be deceived by it. They can believe a lie, saying, no, that isn't the truth. Paul says, no, don't be deceived. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Now this is what he says to the church in Corinth, and such were some of you. <laughs> so they're, they're not doing that stuff anymore. That isn't who they are anymore. They're, such were some of you, but you were washed and you were sanctified, but you, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. The gospel is not something that I believe, as it were, afar off. It's not something that is just an intellectual thing that I agree with. It's the power of God. And the power of God is made manifest in you. God raised his son with power, but he makes the power apply. And he raises you up with Christ so that you can walk in newness of life. So that you don't have to, I don't have to do all that stuff anymore. I get to walk in love. I get to walk with Jesus. I get to know his power at work in my life. I get to know even when I don't feel like doing something, if I do what he's wanting me to do, there's a blessing in it. I know that even if it's hard, I was hearing John Piper, I mentioned this this morning, John Piper made a, a statement, he, he, he's a preacher out of the U.S., he's a, an author, man of God, and uh, he made this statement, he says, I'm not convinced that all these addictions that people say that they have are real. He, he said, if, if you were sitting in your room by yourself and you had your phone out and you're getting ready to look at things that you shouldn't, and, and this is the way he put it, and ISIS comes into the room and they've got your wife and they've got a, a knife to her throat, saying, if you look at that, she dies. Better yet, if you look at it, you die. Because some of you might want to get rid of your wife. That'd be really bad. <laughs> he said, you know, you'd put that phone down. Because the cost of what you would lose was greater than the pleasure you think you'd have. And that's just in the natural. That's not even in the power of God. So I can say to you, the good news is there's freedom. <laughs> real, real freedom. I don't have to walk in darkness anymore. I know him and I'm known by him. Paul's saying, listen, I'm a, I'm a bondservant of Christ. I'm called to be an apostle. I, in fact, three times in those first few verses of Romans, he uses the, words, he uses the word call or called. Do you know in, in the Greek, the word called means, there's two aspects. It's one, by invitation. Secondly, by appointment. So, have you ever had a party and you send out invitations? Who do you send them to? Just everybody? Uh, when I was younger, we had a party like that once. We invited everybody. Everybody came. <laughs> the cake dried up in a matter of moments and then there was riot, holes in the walls. It was horrible. When Paul was called to be an apostle, was, was that open to everybody? Or was that directed? Paul was invited. He was appointed. He says, and those in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Jesus said, many are called. Few are chosen. He says it repeatedly. If you get an invite for a party, you, usually there's a time and what? A date and a place. And if you put it on the shelf and you forget about it and the time goes past, 
You miss it. Listen to me, please. I love you. I, I don't do this for the money. I do it because Jesus touched my life. And he gave me the call to come and to be here. And I've given up everything numerous times. And I'm here tonight for you, not for me. I could have, eas not, I could have easily stayed home because I have a message that he's given me. It's not even mine. But the invitation is going out. And if you're not careful, some of you might bypass the time where the opportunity for you to respond to that invitation will go. Please hear me. Salvation is of the Lord. It doesn't originate in you. It's not up to you. If you invite someone to your party, who's in charge? You are. This is God's party. He's in charge. Please hear me. You say, well, you're trying to scare me. No, I'm, I'm warning you. Because the, the end consequence of missing out is hell. Is being condemned for your own stuff. And there isn't a way out and it isn't for a little period of time. It's serious. Jim, he gave you a second chance to live for him with all your life. He raised you from the dead. You're the head of your house, man. Hallelujah. Amen. Some of you, you've come, you listen to me preach, and maybe you're entertained. I don't know. I find that scary sometimes. Because if, if you don't hear, and that invitation comes to you, you're like, well, or maybe you come so close and you taste and you are part of things and then you, you're often doing things you ought not to. I don't want to see that for you. This is real. Jesus is risen from the dead. Amen. And in him there's life. And that more abundantly. Let's pray. Lord, we just say to you tonight that we believe you, Jesus. You are the Son of God with power. That you are risen from the dead and you have redeemed people for your very self. And I thank you that through the invitation of the gospel, through the proclamation of it, Lord, you save those who believe, those who come, those who surrender, those who turn to, to you from darkness to light from the power of Satan to God, that they'll receive forgiveness and inheritance among those that are sanctified, made holy by you. And I pray tonight, Lord, that Lord, where the gospel is your power, Lord, and it, it, it saves and it continues to challenge us, it's not just something that our heads are about, but Lord, those who believe that are zealous for good works, that there's a lifestyle of reality of the fruit of your Spirit in us. That we would be those, like Paul, we're bond servants of Christ. We may not be apostles today, but um, we're sent by Christ. We, we're sent ones. It may not be, Lord, that we, we have some amazing thought of ministry, but Lord, we've been set apart by your gospel to belong to you as sons and daughters. And Lord, you intend on using us and empowering us, but Lord, you said in your word that it's more important that our names are written in heaven than even having demons submit to us in your name. Lord, I pray tonight, I do, I pray you'll shake up false foundations. I pray that those that are on the verge of, as it were, going back, like Pastor Claire said, that you'd shake them out of their lethargy and the deception I, I pray for those tonight, Lord, where the invitation's on the shelf. And they think there's time. Oh, Father, have mercy. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you would, in your kindness, in your mercy, you would bring your conviction upon them and they would see you as you are. You would respond because they need you. 
And Lord, I pray for those that are walking it and those that are charging forward and those that are praying it through and those that are that have their eyes fixed like Paul as bond servants, they just love you. And Lord, that you'd strengthen them in these days. They would not become discouraged by even 10,000 falling at their right hand, but Lord, that there'll be those that have their eyes fixed and will keep running the race that's set before them. We pray for strength and endurance. Holy Spirit, we bless them with grace upon grace upon grace. Thank you for your word. Thank you that it it's, makes things clear so that we can respond with clarity. And Lord, we just ask you to move afresh in our midst. Lord, I pray that, that the gift of the fear of the Lord would be our portion. Amen. Lord, you said it's the beginning of wisdom. Oh, Lord, shake us up, lift us up, strengthen us in these days, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.